Okay, so um, as I was saying before, uh, today we are starting uh, to um, analyze the React framework. Uh, the reason uh, um, is that you found it uh, during the labs. So it's quite complicated to put everything together in a web application just by using, uh, uh, you know, native JavaScript and nothing more. Um, especially when you have to uh, implement dynamic behavior in your application. So uh, there's a lot of question about where to store the data, how to synchronize elements, uh, how to guarantee that the user doesn't ask or doesn't click on any button or action when I'm not ready to process it and so on. Hmm? Uh, nothing that cannot be solved with a lot of discipline and uh, thinking, uh, but the problem is that uh, every operation you need to do need uh, it should be done at the DOM level, so by mm, quite a low level of programming with all the details of the HTML elements. And every time you have to change a part of the page, you have to rebuild that page uh, by working with the DOM. It's, it gets uh, really heavy. Okay, So that's why different uh, frameworks have been um, introduced. Um, just for, for uh, say, um, handling for you, for us, uh, the most common part of the operation, and so that we can focus on the development of the application and uh, our components. Uh, the framework that we are going to use is the probably most popular ones uh, today. Maybe next year or in two years, it will it won't, it won't be <laughs> the the best one or the most popular one, uh, because these kind of tools uh, evolve very rapidly, very quickly. So maybe there's some some new framework that comes out and changes everything. So that's why we still need to have our strong grounding into DOM and JavaScript uh, because they will be there forever. And the frameworks that will exp that exploit, the, exploit them probably will, uh, will change in the future, okay? Um, the concepts uh, behind the, um, React are quite uh, um, simple and uh, and uh, compact basically uh, we have some design principles uh, and then a, an extensive library to, to help us uh, implement these principles and of course it's built on top of js so we are we will exploit a lot of the strange things that we had to learn about js also here hmm? um, why do we want to work uh, within a, a framework? But basically, uh, to simplify our work, uh, that's the, the first goal. And uh, uh, to uh, simplifying uh, from both from the point of view of the interaction with the browser. So, uh, for example, we we don't we didn't appreciate that. But if you start doing complex application, you start uh, you will discover that the DOM is not exactly standard, and every browser implements some properties uh, in a different way. So we would like we would have to to take into account uh, for these variations, um, and uh, uh, in many cases. Uh, uh, the, the components okay, that, that we have are basically HTML elements that are quite low level. So we want to build, say, more complex components, like a block uh, of code that can be reused uh, uh, many times. And this block will contain many nodes inside. HTML has no um, feature for providing us with a grouping uh, of, uh, of elements that we call components in React. Mm -hmm. And also um, all the events, uh, all the sorry, all the event pro event processing is also a, um, a very complex stuff to do because we have to rely on the DOM events, uh, capture them when they appear, and then the the event handlers are scattered throughout all our code. Hmm? Um, and so uh, again, the framework will probably do some work for us. And also the development. Uh, so we are not just simplifying the code but we are also trying to simplify the development environment uh, um, where we already we can exploit some, some patterns uh, that have been developed. And so we can have some, let's say, high level rules or, or about how to organize uh, um, our application. Uh, and, uh, and these rules in many cases are already implemented or helped by some plugins that we can add to our application. So we can really exploit a lot of code that is available. 
Um, and the most complex, uh, I would say, the most complex issue uh, in any web application, probably in any uh, computer application, is the management of state. Okay, when we have uh, uh, an asynchronous application like a web page where a lot of things are happening in, in parallel in different parts of the page, uh, where is the information about which is the real value, the last value uh, that we want to show, or the the last modification to that value. So synchronizing all of this stuff uh, is one of the main goals uh, of, of all these uh, um, web, web frameworks, including including React. Uh, right now, for example, in your uh, to-do list, uh, you may have noticed maybe, uh, where do I store, for example, the list uh, of tasks? Uh, do I store that into the page so the list of size will be the list item themselves, or do I build a, um, an array in JavaScript, and then from the array, I will generate the list in the page, in the DOM. Uh, there are complexities in, bo in both ways, uh, but once you have a data structure and the representation of this data structure, keeping them in sync uh, is, is a real big problem, okay? So this is something that uh, React will help us to, to overcome in some way. Uh, most uh, information that we need about uh, React can be uh, gathered from uh, uh, from the official website. So the official website is reactjs.org. Uh, you see it here. Uh, sorry, you see it here, uh, reactjs.org, where you can find both the um, uh, tutorial, basically, uh, and uh, uh, the main concepts. So. Uh, there are basically these two pages, uh, the tutorial and the so-called hello world or main concepts section are two different ways uh, of learning more or less the same content, depending on whether you prefer uh, following a tutorial or you prefer um, learning the concepts one by one and then put them together with examples uh, uh, that are scattered through, through the definitions. So this is the main source of information done by the uh, the authors of React. With by the way, um, they are from Facebook. So React is the framework that was developed by the Facebook company and is running the Facebook website. So something that uh, we can assume that uh, is very well maintained and uh, uh, very well uh, tested. Okay. So this is the main. Uh, uh, resource we will we are not going to follow exactly uh, this uh, um, uh, say sequence of, of concepts in particular uh, this part here of uh, state life cycle and uh, uh, and and events but basically this part uh, five and uh, and six are um, well, we'll see in a moment, uh, are using a, an older convention, the traditional convention of, uh, um, of the state representation. Uh, we are going to use a, a newer one, which is called the hooks. So we are, in some points, we are diverging from the, the official, uh, uh, say, sequence of concept, uh, but we are still, of course, in, inside everything that is supported in, uh, in React. So what we'll tell you. Uh, there are also other resources like books, uh, like uh, some real, let's say, paper books uh, or some online books that you can download for free. Uh, there are really a, a lot of material about, uh, about React. And uh, um, last but not least, there are some development tools. So if you have a, a browser, you can install some extension which is called React Developer Tools. Just be aware of, of installing the, the official one from, uh, from the React team or from the Facebook team. Um, they will extend basically your uh, page inspector uh, with uh, uh, two new uh, tabs that will show you uh, a view of the page in terms of React components like these ones instead of, uh, um, of just uh, DOM nodes or HTML nodes, okay? But we'll see that. Uh, so uh, it's something that you should uh, install into your the browser that you are using. Okay, so let's go to the uh, to the main concept, the basic principles that we uh, that the React is built uh, onto. Some of them you already know them in the in general uh, in in the general JavaScript programming, and uh, um, the principle for react is that you will or we will never 
have a, a more uh, need to manip manipulate the DOM. Okay, so uh, the the DOM of the page is a property basically of the React library. So we are telling React how to build the DOM. We are not building the DOM ourselves. With a very few exceptions, we will never have to uh, pick the properties of a node. We will never have to um, um, find a DOM node for doing some operations on it. Uh, we work at a higher level of, of, uh, of representation, which is called the virtual DOM in, in React. Okay, uh, we are uh, extremely declarative in in, uh, in our code. So if we have different operations that happens in diff happen in different parts of the page, we are just uh, writing what happens here and there, but we are not defining, we are not controlling when a given operation will be executed. So the execution and the scheduling of operation will be uh, the goal, the, the purpose of React. So that will be done automatically by the library. I only have to specify when some value change and then React will decide what needs to be updated on the page after the change of that variable. So it's a lot, a very um, variable based, very state based, depending on the value or some variables. So everything else will be adjusted and, and computed and updated. Basically, we work with components. Okay, so the basic building block in React is a component which is a part of the page. Of course, this component will be um, created by combining DOM elements, but we don't see the, the DOM itself. And uh, the component has only one goal in its life, basically, being able to render itself. So when it, uh, say um, a component may be, a, I don't know, a form, maybe a button, maybe uh, a menu in the page. And the only goal that the component has is the, to render itself, to, to transform itself into, um, into part of the web page. According to some, of course, parameters that the component receives, so it may render itself in different ways. And the component in rendering itself may use, may include other components that in turn will have to render themselves and so on. So this rendering is basically transforming uh, to transform to DOM, to, real, to, to the real DOM. Components are abstract, high level components that know how to represent themselves in the page. Uh, these are the principles. And everything in React is uh, highly functional. So functional means uh, we are defining stateless function that are uh, called whenever something else uh, happens and, and so on. Well, okay, we already know some, some functional design uh, uh, patterns and functional uh, programming relies a lot on on um, immutable data. So objects that cannot be changed, but they only can be rebuilt from scratch and rebuilding them triggers a set, a set of, of actions of function to be, to be executed. Uh, and the basic principle is that to avoid problems with synchronizing different parts of the page, like I select a filter, so I need to change the highlighting on the filters and I need to change the list of displayed items. And maybe I also need to change the count of items. So maybe uh, displaying seven items out of 20. So for a single user action, I need to change different parts of the page. And when I, I'm undoing that action, I need to undo everything in the different parts of the page. So it's very easy to forget some dependency or not to keep track of everything on the page. And so having some inconsistent state of the page. The solution uh, done by React is very easy. Whenever something changes, okay, we rebuild, re-render, reconstruct the whole page. Okay, if I change a filter, I uh, React will ask all the components in the page, please repaint yourself, re-render yourself, uh, but keep uh, with the new data that I'm providing you. And so every component will start from scratch. I don't need to remember how the list was before clicking on the button. I just need to know the current state of the filter and then I will render the list. I will render the count, I will render the menu. 
knowing which filter or which filters are currently selected. I, I create from scratch, so I don't have the, uh, the legacy of the previous version. I don't have to delete something that I know it was there and so on, okay? Um, and this will be recreated, not on the real DOM, like I was saying before, but on a virtual version of the DOM. So there will be another data structure that uh, we are working with, basically, mm, you know, that we are creating, basically, at every refresh of the page, at every re-render, we are creating new, uh, you know, in this virtual DOM. And the transformation from the virtual DOM, which is revealed every time, to the real DOM is, again, a task of the, of the library. Um, uh, uh, no, the performance is not terrible, Matteo, because I, I will show you in, in a couple of slides that React is, is more intelligent than we think. Uh, the new render page, everything happens. Oh, yes, I forgot to say that. Everything happens at the client side. Okay. Uh, so uh, React is basically 100% um, running on the browser, except for some build scripts at the beginning. Okay, so this mechanism may, may seem strange, okay, to us, because we are not thinking about, about how to change the page. We need to think about how to recreate the page with the, the current new state. This is a way of thinking. Basically, it's a function, okay? So from state to the DOM, this is our function. A function doesn't depend on the previous state. It only depends on the current state. So our application will be the implementation of this function. Everything, or oh, basically it's not the DOM, but it's a virtual DOM, okay? Everything, everything else is taken care uh, by, the, um, by, by the library. Uh, basically, there's a bit more in this functional notation. Uh, a given part of the page hmm, is combined, uh, is computed by a function that we define. So that these are the components, basically, that depends uh, on two different uh, type of variables. One are so-called properties or uh, arguments or parameters, something that is in input, for example. No? For example, I want to render a block uh, uh, showing, uh, uh, I don't know, the, a, a list of, uh, of filters, so I, and one of the parameters will be the color in which to render them. So it's an, ex an external value that they take into account in creating the element. So it's something that comes from the outside into the function itself. And, <clears throat> but uh, the second, uh, set of parameters are the real state parameters, so the current values in the application, in the component. Um, the managing of state is quite complex, so we'll take it one step at a time. So for the moment, at the, at the beginning, we'll just consider uh, components that render themselves according to some parameters. Then later on, we will add some state to this component to uh, allow them to manage uh, their life cycle by themselves. So in mo many components, uh, or as many components as possible, don't need to manage the state. So introducing state always introduces complexity. So one of the goals of React is uh, letting you think about which is the real state that we need and where to put in, which component needs to manage that part. Okay, that will be the task for, for, for next week, basically. Um, <clears throat> And so uh, if we don't forget the state management for a moment, uh, a, a given part of the virtual DOM, a given component, uh, just the implementation of a function that given a set of, a set of properties will return me a set of uh, user interface fragments, a, set, a portion, a tree portion of the virtual DOM. And this function should be like we call it uh, idempotent. So if we call the function twice or three times or four times with the same properties, we will get exactly the same um, component. We will get exactly the same result, okay? And everything is immutable, so properties cannot be changed. And uh, the result here cannot be changed later. We can only recompute, we cannot change. Hmm? Um, this the, the the functional model works well when we only have properties, okay? The more complex things is that uh, 
uh, like uh, Andrew is asking, uh, what is what, what do you mean by state? Okay, so imagine a list of filters. Okay, today, tomorrow, last seven days, and so on. Okay, so this can be a component. This menu here can be a component, and uh, um, this, this component may have some properties. The properties may be, for example, the, the list of options. For example, okay, if, you, if we don't want to bind uh, this filter list uh, to, a, to a given set of options, we can give them as a, an array, for example, of the different uh, uh, options today, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So this is something that is constant. It may change because uh, maybe we are uh, in a given part of the application. You you may want to show other set of filters, or we may want to hide some of them, for example. And every time the the this list changes, okay, every time these properties are recomputed, then this component is repainted, is regenerated. But this is something that the component uh, um, receives from outside. Then we have the user that selects one of the filters. So this component has the information about the selected filter. Which one is selected? This information is an internal state of the component because it may change according to some actions that happens inside the component. So the component will uh, highlight this, uh, this line or another line, depending on what was selected. But the only place where we know the information about what was selected is actually inside this component. So it's no longer true that the given set of properties will render exactly the same menu. We render a menu that is also updated uh, when some internal state changes. Okay, so it's something that <clears throat> uh, evolves when the user does some actions or some clicks with the application that will change some values, maybe the, a variable that we just call selected. And uh, according to this, the value of this variable plus the properties, then we redefine uh, the, uh, the menu, okay, the, the, the layout. Um, to answer to Giuseppe, yes, this F uh, re, uh, say, suggested that we, we should think at components like uh, uh, functional uh, programming patterns by creating these functions as pure as possible, okay, like you're mentioning. Uh, the properties are immutable to a component, so they are input values that will never change. You, you cannot change them, only the the bigger component that is calling you can re recreate a, a new set of properties for you. But inside the components, they are read-only. They cannot be changed. And also the state can only be changed in a very controlled way through special calls. So they are not variable that you can change freely. Uh, you Because the, okay, the management of these changes and the propagation of these changes must be known by, by the framework. So we must be careful about defining which variables compose the state and how to evolve them. It will not be complicated, uh, say, from the code point of view, just uh, using the, 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 the suitable functions. And all functions that we create should be pure function in, in the functional style. Okay, so they have, should have no side effects, no global variable, variables, no changes to external data structures, and so on. So this is what guarantees that actually your uh, uh, your application will be prop may be properly managed by the by the library. Okay, you are play if you play by the rules, then the library will do the rest. Um, so we are creating a set of components. Every component uh, is uh, rendered in terms of other components or in terms of DOM nodes, and every time a state is changed. Every time a prop or property is changed, 
the whole application or the whole part of the application that depends on that state is re-rendered from scratch. Every component will rebuild it from scratch. And this is true. Okay. But we are not saying that uh, uh, we are rebuilding a part of the HTML page. We are only rebuilding a part of the virtual DOM. And there are no rules. You can just have a minor variation like highlighting the third item or uh, rendering something totally different right? or uh, not rendering anything at all, maybe if some uh, property has changed. Okay, so we may all uh, be scared about the performance of this approach. Okay, you are changing one variable, then you need to rebuild everything from scratch. Well, really, we are rebuilding uh, the virtual DOM, which is just an internal data structure inside React. We are not interacting with the browser itself because modifying the, the real DOM is the, ex, the expensive operation where the browser needs to recompute all the layout, uh, rearrange items and so on. Hmm? That will be the real expensive information, so uh, operation. So what React does is give us a simplified version of the DOM, this virtual DOM. It's just an internal data structure. You can have different not you. React has different versions of this data structure, the previous one, the next one, and so on. And it's really more uh, simpler than the DOM itself. Uh, uh, and uh, it's very fast to operate. But it's just, you know, just a tree in, in tree of elements in memory. Uh, just that it's very I say lightweight to, to manipulate. Okay. And so it's not very expensive to recreate a, a new virtual DOM or the Virtual DOM corresponding to, to the to a part of the page because it's just you know, uh, creating objects. You you see the the, the call for creating them. Uh, then, when the recreation of the virtual DOM is finished, React will do a diff between the new virtual DOM and the previous version of the virtual DOM that will correspond to the page, and will decide. Uh, to apply only the modification on the differences to the real browser's DOM. So maybe you are, we are recreating a long list of elements and the browser will only modify three DOM nodes because all the other ones are the same as before. Okay, so this is where we are not losing performance by rebuilding everything. We are, what we are rebuilding is a very lightweight component. It's a very lightweight data structure. And the real updating of the page is done with a difference algorithm that is inside inside React. Okay, so this diff, uh, of course, need, doesn't need to be uh, an optimized diff. Uh, it just need to be quick uh, because what we need. Uh, okay, basically, you could also rebuild everything in the DOM, but then we, we it would be really slow. So you want to try to rebuild. If something has changed in this node, we will recreate. Uh, re-render this node and this not includes another one so probably also this one needs to be re-rendered and so we are the new virtual dom now contains two modified nodes and then in the browser uh, the, uh, the the difference uh, between the previous version of this node and the new version of this node is propagated so if this is composed of different DOM nodes uh, and these are different in, internally, they'll only delta you know, uh, mm, deltas are propagated. So only minor. If you are only changing an attribute, only that attribute is, is changed. You are not uh, rebuilding the real DOM node in the browser. But everything here happens in an invisible way to us, uh, in an indivisible and intelligent way. So all the modifications are done. Uh, at the same time, so they are batching and they're combining. So a lot of intelligence and performance tweaking goes inside this um, this, uh, uh, this cycle. Uh, well, also, also about uh, even, even handling, uh, React implements a, a simplified version of the DOM events, like the click events and so on, um, and uh, it hides all the complexity about the event, event propagation, bubbling, uh, prevention, and so on. Okay, so again, we are working in a more simplified uh, world compared to the to the raw uh, DOM level. Okay, so back to the code. Uh, how does an application work in in React? Okay, basically, uh, React is done 
or is created by a, a series of calls like this of this function there is this render function like we said uh, every component should render itself so what we are saying is that uh, we asked it to the to the react library to render a component inside a container node so we are rendering an element here uh, in a second we'll see the difference between elements and components uh, which is a fragment of of, uh, of code of the virtual DOM. So it's a virtual DOM fragment inside a node. This is a real DOM node. Okay, so what we are asking is uh, to take this virtual DOM fragment, uh, convert it into real DOM nodes. Making the diff with the real with the current content of this container node with this div probably will be probably a div and update the content of that div. Uh, this call is usually usually done at the top level of the application, uh, and uh, it mounts the application into the web page. Of course, recursively, if this is not just an H1, but is a higher level component, that component itself will be rendered inside, um, inside the new DOM nodes that are being created. So basically, this rendering is a recursive procedure. We only call the top level, and then everything will be propagated by, uh, by React itself down to the container nodes. So this, there's, but this rendering always has two different sides: what to render and where to render it. Uh, we can have a, uh, there's a strange syntax here. So wh why did you put some HTML here without putting quotes around it? So you could imagine that this uh, is an error in the slide. Actually, it's not, because um, React is extending the JavaScript syntax also to include some. HTML fragments that are dealt with the um, like, like they were objects. So it's a shortcut that React gives us with the, a new syntax, which is called JSX, uh, JavaScript extension or something like that, um, where we can use a, an HTML-like syntax inside any JavaScript code. And this will be automatically converted by by a transpiler uh, into this equivalent JavaScript code. So when I write uh, div here, I'm I'm actually writing uh, uh, create a new div node from this React library, and I'm giving some properties, some attributes to these nodes. The attribute ID is a test, and I wrote it in the HTML-like way. But actually, I'm creating this node by providing a list of attributes and providing a list of children. And these children will be an H1 node and a P node that I can write using the HTML-like syntax just by in the, uh, nesting them into the previous one. And these nodes, on turn, they have some list of properties. In this case, they don't have any attributes here and there. And they may have a content, which in this case is just a string, it's just text content. So uh, the creation or the description of the component is done by creating elements uh, the, in, in React in, with, with the library primitives. So uh, create there's a generic function create element that is customized to create divs, to create h1s, to create paragraphs, and so on. So we are creating these objects by providing uh, by specifying their attributes and their children. Okay. We could write this code, but it's quite verbose and uh, to, to write. Or we can directly uh, use this JSX syntax, which is totally equivalent. Okay, so it's translated before being compiled. Uh, we uh, we will uh, basically always use the JSX syntax because much more readable and uh, and and easier to write. Uh, but it's not. It doesn't change the. Um, let's say the nature of what we are, we are doing. 
okay um of course we will be a, a this compilation here of course will uh, will uh, slow down the startup of the application okay at the start time we'll have maybe a two or three seconds of delay okay we can deal with that but then uh, once compiled it runs uh, in javascript hmm? so what we said uh, about uh, recreating the virtual dom is basically a set of calls to these functions so by creating objects and nesting objects and we have a simplified syntax uh, for describing them but since they are totally equivalent uh, this is just uh, you see a function call at the top level we are calling a function open and close brace so basically also here this is a function call this is an, a normal expression everywhere uh, a javascript expression goes you can write uh, um, a jsx fragment and this jsx will return a react tree of elements hmm, that you can use in different places so, so it's not a special syntax inside the render it's a general extension to the javascript syntax um, Alfredo, there can be multiple renders or just one. Uh, there can be many, but usually, be, if we want to attach different, uh, say, sub applications to different parts of the page, but usually for simple application, you on, we only have one at the root element, and then everything will be done by nesting components instead of calling different renders. The other renders will be called uh, recursively, hmm? uh, directly by the library itself. Okay, uh, we create these components, then we will go directly to shortly to an example with the code of how this works. But we are just setting the main concepts, uh, concept for the moment. And uh, uh, all the data flow in these components is very strictly controlled and very strictly unidirectional. So uh, like uh, separation from the view, uh, from the actions and from the current state, uh, you can call it model view controller if you want. Uh, basically, you have a model that contains the state. You have the view, which is the DOM representation of that state. So here we are with the virtual DOM. They will be mapped, of course, to the real DOM, but it's something that we don't control directly. And the, uh, the actions of the users uh, are managed by event handlers uh, that con that play the role of controller, basically, of doing inside an event tender, you can change the state. Changing the state will we may, will trigger a re-rendering of, of some component. And this component may be changes uh, compared to its previous version. OK, but you cannot change this cycle in any way. So the only way to change a state is to process an event. The only way to process an event is to interact with the view. The only way to change the view is to change some state or properties that the function depends on it. So it's a very strict life cycle. You cannot play with that, which is good because at least we have a framework to work with and we don't need to care about side effects or race conditions, what happens before, what happens next, how to catch an event before that other one is fired and so on. Okay, It's all managed by the library. And this means that the state uh, is always uh, owned by a component. It's not the state of the application that we are talking about, but the state of every each and every component in React. And so if I have a component that includes uh, many other components inside, and this component has a state variable s, if we change s, this effect may only uh, affect this component and its children. A change in the variable s uh, cannot affect any other part of the application because that variable is only visible inside that component and can only be changed by that component, by its owner. So the children can see, in, under some conditions, can see the value of the state, but they cannot modify it. Only the component that owns a state variable can modify um, its value. So it's very well controlled. Every where you declare a state variable, you know that that, that is the only component that may change that value. It can propagate this value to its children and not outside its children, its children tree. Okay. 
So this you many, many times calls for moving up to bigger components, to larger components, uh, the, um, the state variables that affect most of the application. And moving down to the, to the list of the, um, of the component tree, those state variables that only affect uh, maybe the, the, um, the behavior of a given part of, of the page and that are not interesting for the rest of the application. So this uh, is a game that we'll try to play. It's not, uh, it's not easy to get at the beginning, uh, um, but uh, the rules are quite simple to follow. We just need to get used into to thinking about uh, the three components and where to locate the state and how to propagate the state from top to bottom. Components may be anything. Anything in the page is a component, uh, uh, a single span is a component, uh, the whole body is a component. Uh, uh, just imagine any any portion of the page, uh, you can call it component, and the component may nest other components. Uh, a component may have different instances, so this is a component called block post, which is uh, used three times in the same page as child, of uh, maybe um, an article section or a main section of the page, for example. Okay, we can instantiate, we can call a component many times, and, and every time uh, the component will have probably different properties. So having different properties, it will render a different content. It will render a bit differently depending because it will update, uh, uh, up. it will create this piece, his piece of, of virtual DOM according to the new values of the properties. So it's just a function. You can call the function many times uh, with different parameters. Like here, we are instantiating a component many times with different properties, with the same idea. Uh, we are not explicitly calling the function, the component function, but we are saying where it should be called, inside which other components, it's all declaratives, okay? So we are telling to the component how to render itself, but we are not saying render now, except at the beginning when you are mount mounting the application. Um, and creating a component uh, is quite actually quite easy because a component is just a function. It's just a JavaScript function. You can use any, any of, the, of the JavaScript function um, um, definition syntaxes, any of the four of them, uh, it doesn't matter. You just create a function. In, in this case, the function blog post excerpt um uh, that uh, returns a, a piece of virtual dom sorry okay it's just a normal function that returns a fragment of the page uh nothing more okay this function can build the fragment of the page by using jsx syntax by using react uh, components react sorry react element uh, calls okay as we said, we know that these are normal calls for creating objects, uh, and but we are writing them in JSX syntax for for simplicity, and for um, for speed, and for uh, readability. There is also a second way of creating um, React components uh, that uses uh, JavaScript classes. Okay, uh, it's um, it's grayed out uh, because we are not uh, using this uh, uh, syntax uh, in in our course. So there are uh, two alternatives. You can use both of them, but we, we choose not to, not to lose time to, to learn both, both of them. But basically the idea is that also in this case, you create a class that has one method called render, and this method will return the same actually uh, virtual DOM of the other one. So it's, a, it's an older syntax. At the beginning, React only supported this class syntax, which was a bit more verbose, you see. Um, and then they they define the simpler syntax, the functional way. And uh, uh, it, uh, until a couple of years ago, you needed to learn both of them because some things like the state management could only be done with classes. So that's why we had still had the longer syntax for classes because we, if you want to manage some state, you had in the past to use uh, um, classes. And uh, and the function for everything else because they were simpler. Right now we are learning hooks, which is a recent addition to to React that allows also functions to to manage the state. So we don't need classes anymore. Uh, 
So if you see some code, uh, you may, may see some sometimes where components are declared as classes. We still didn't study the classes in JavaScript right now because we don't need them for the moment. Um, they will come later. But uh, uh, it's the same as, as a simple function. Okay. So for us, we only use this and we'll never say discard the class syntax anymore. We know it's there. We don't get scared, but uh, it's just a different way of creating a component. And uh, thinking about components, uh, you may uh, think that some components uh, probably are have a just container role. So components that are uh, just defined for nesting objects, for managing children, for uh, in setting up the layout and so on. And uh, especially for managing the state for uh, some group of children. So since one, you know the, the to-do list uh, you have the filters here and you have uh, the list uh, of to-dos there one two three four so where would you put uh, the knowledge of uh, which filter is currently selected i cannot put it here inside the filter list because otherwise it would not be visible by the list to be rendered i need to have Okay, because the state is only visible to a component and its children. We must have a bigger component where we manage the state about the selected uh, item, and we can propagate this state uh, to both uh, sub components. Okay. okay, so we'll have a, a container that is there for pulling together some components that need to share a state and will define that state and the rules for modifying that state. And in this kind of components may also uh, communicate with the backend. So with a server where we have stored the tasks into the database. Okay. Um, and many other components are just presentational components that are just generated now to be displayed. So the whole, their goal is to display. Usually they only have props, properties, yes, but no state. Hmm. Uh, where we only display something based on the information we receive. So basically also in the, in the design of the components, uh, we tend to think about, okay, this component is managing some state information, some application logic, and these other components just used for displaying for layout information. Okay. Um, to answer uh, Gabriele uh, about uh, the difference between classes and, and function with hooks, uh, uh, React is totally symmetric, basically. You, ca you could create a application, a component with classes, or we could create uh, uh, components with functions uh, plus hooks, uh, which are a set of uh, special calls, okay? Special function calls. There are two, uh, the, these are two programming styles. Uh, you can accomplish the same with either style. We decided to focus more on this way, which is, let's say, more modern. But basically simpler and also faster and uh, so we are working with that we don't need to work or learn uh, classes okay or today there is no need to uh, to use a class like there was in the past where hooks were not invented yet so you had to rely on classes for some for some purposes okay um Marta is asking uh, to define the React fragment is equivalent to defining a static page in the sense that they can do anything without the interaction of the user in a the sense they are empty. Um, they are uh, components uh, that may define um, their layout, but we may also attach uh, uh, event handlers to them. Okay, so we may have attributes like on click where the user can interact in, in a way, okay? And the event handler will decide, uh, but we'll see an example in, in a second, basically, okay? So we are, but from the component point of view, uh, it's static. Given some properties, I need to render the component in this way. Okay, no exceptions. Uh, but uh, um, 
once I start dealing with event handlers, they will they have the the capability of changing the state, and changing the state also means uh, um, being able to uh, to say let the application evolve so the component will render in a different way okay uh, just to get to the to the example uh, properties may be objects normally just to and this fits the the answer to Marta the slides um, we may have uh, values numbers strings uh, uh, to be passed as properties like normal function calls but yeah, remember we are in JavaScript, so you can pass a function also to a component. So a, a component may also receive function properties, and these function properties will be callbacks that the component may call to uh, to access the parents methods, to access the parent state, and so on. Okay, so we have uh, data that flows uh, from top to bottom and actions that flow from bottom to top, where we have a, um, a, a higher level component and a, a root component that will pass some property to their, chi their children. And the, the child component may call a function that is defined at the father's level. And because this function has been passed as a property, I could never call or know my, my father in any case, but if my father gives me a function, I can call this function that the father is providing to me, and the parent is providing to me. So we have this double flow of information. Okay, uh, this week we will only deal with the top down, and next week we'll deal with the bottom up uh, call of, of the methods. Okay, uh, and also about the states. Uh, uh, states, like we said, uh, is something that is local to a single component. So only a component is a state and it's its property. It may be initialized, the initial value of the state may be computed with the property that the component receives and can be changed by calling the specific methods. And if some children needs to know about the state of the of a father component, we, I have to pass a copy of the value using a property. It's, it's quite simple, actually, when, when we go get down to the code. So let's go down to the code, um, practically. Mm -hmm. uh, at first sight, we need to have a lot of, uh, let's say, um, preparation work. We need to import the React library. We need to configure it to import the, the Babel translator. We need to configure it to translate the JSX code. Um, and uh, since uh, in, the, in the in the browser we need probably to to import many components, okay, uh, in many modules, uh, we need to run the JavaScript code uh, as a module. And running JavaScript code as a module requires me to run, to set up, and run a web server because otherwise the browser will not load code from a module, a, a module from a file system, but only from a known web server and so on. So there's a lot of preparation uh, to do just to write the first lines uh, of code. Mm -hmm. um, and also maybe also some uh, uh, browser compatibility issues so that we can have instruct the Babel translator to compensate from some newer syntax and so on. Uh, all of this, uh, we are lucky, is implemented by uh, um, uh, a, a module which is called create React app. Okay, so create React app uh, only sets up the environment for us to 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 develop. So we could do that by hand, but it will take us probably two days. Uh, with this call, it will install all the needed configuration, all the needed uh, data, and so on. Okay, so I created. Let me open. An empty project. I call it week, week five. Okay. Um, so in a normal folder, you just if you want to create to develop a new uh, application, okay, uh, you just execute this uh, uh, create React app, create React app, 
with the name hello world with the name of your application okay mpx is not npm but it's mpx mpx uh, run downloads a module and runs it immediately so i don't need to do npm install and then run the command but usually uh, mpx and it will download and run the command immediately and uh, this command will be saved so you don't need actually it will not be downloaded every time only the first time and it will be saved in the in the node uh, in the node cache okay so if we just issue this command the single command and then we wait huh? what is doing here is uh, it, it installed the create react command and create react will uh, create a new folder here and uh, uh, create um, a packet.json file at the beginning and then npm will be will install all the packages required by this packet.json I, I i don't open it right now because uh, it's still modifying it okay so it's loading uh, something like uh, 270 megabytes or something like that with just one single command and we are populating all your uh, node modules you see that node modules is starting to to have a real lot of stuff uh, that we don't really want to be aware of okay <laughs> this is what they are doing so just preparing this we just need to okay And of course, it's very important that uh, it also create a git ignore file uh, so that uh, all these node modules uh, folders will not be committed to git. Okay, so if you open the git ignore, it has been created automatically. I didn't do anything except that command. Uh, it excludes immediately the node modules directory from, from git. Okay, otherwise you will be committed uh, to 100 megabytes and, and more. Okay. It, it, uh, it's done, okay, after a lot of messages that we don't care about, uh, it's done, it says, okay, um, success, we created the Hello World application in this folder, and you can run, run several commands, for example, npm start and start the server. Start the web server that will contain a, a web application, a React application. So let's try npm, ah, oh, sorry, we need to enter. So the last few lines are really foolproof. Enter into the directory that has been created. We see some content and we npm start. And what happens is that it's starting a server and this server will do all the compilation or that is needed in JavaScript and so on. And we'll offer a web page into uh, a web address. Uh, well, it depends here the, the, the name and the IP address, of, of course, depend on your configuration, whether you're on Mac, on Windows, uh, or in, on Linux, on WSL, and so on. We will tell you where the website is published. Of course, it's just a development website, only, lo only visible locally from your computer. And if you open a browser to that address, what you see is basically a first running application. Okay, this is just, you see localhost 3000, it's already an, a React application which is running. An empty, the default one, the empty one. And we, we may modify it, we may play with this application. Okay, so just the first step is always just this command and everything is already ready to go it creates a, a long list of node modules and uh, two folders in which we are developing one is a public folder that will contain HTML files basically or images static content 
and another is a source folder that will contain all JavaScript and CSS code. Uh, this creation, yes, Andrea, needs to be done every time we need we want to create a new application, a new project, basically. A new web application will create a new folder with all uh, that is needed inside. Uh, why does the interrun on the default 80 port? Well, uh, because it's a um, development server, so it's not ready for production. Uh, and the, the port 80 is only accessible if you run with the administrator of privileges in, uh, in, uh, in your operating system. And when you are developing, you don't want to run your applications as root because <laughs> there may be uh, um, um, they may have bugs, they may create problems and so on. So it will run on another port. You can, of course, change the port number if you want, but uh, by default, it runs on a non-privileged non port because just for development, okay? Then when you deploy it really, you can move to a real server and publish it on a, on a, on a well-known port. Hmm? Uh, in fact, it's called a development server. Uh, usually the website will not, will not run for real on this development server. This development server is running with node, okay, which is slower. You will move it to a real server uh, after a step, which is uh, uh, the creation of the final build, okay? But let's do one step at a time. Hmm? So what happens here is that we have, um, we, we can see it directly in, in the code, probably it's easier. So this public directory and the source directory, the public directory contains an index.html file that we may modify. We cannot move it, you cannot rename it, but if you want, you can modify the content. It already gives you some, some default. And it contains, very important, this div with ID root. This is the mount point for your application. React will insert the application inside this div. The rest of the HTML is just static content that you may have, but the application will re actually replace or be being deployed inside this div, okay? This is the index, we don't need to touch it. We just need to remember, okay, this is the application. This is the place where the application will be mounted. Uh, in this public directory, we, don't, we only probably have this file and images if you want to load them or here or in subfolder. The public is, the directory is published as the web root, okay? So slash index.html means this file. Slash logo 512 means this file. If you create a subdirectory under public, they would be under the first slash of, our, of your website. And then we have the source directory. Well, all the code is um, running. In particular, we have an index.js, which is the first one to be called. So you cannot change the name of index.html because it's are coded and also index.js. And where you see the real call to the uh, React application, to start the React application, react dom.render. Okay, that renders a fragment of code into the root element that we just saw in the, in the um, index.html file and uh, this code reends uh, okay defines strict modes and the calls and a component that is called uh, app okay so we are it's saying that inside the root element of the html file render the component called app what is this component is completely up to us. It's our application. We just have to modify the behavior of this app component to create our own behavior. And what is an app? It's a function defined somewhere that will render the appropriate part of the code. Um, there's a question from Gabin saying, I get a permission, operation not permitted. Probably, are you in a in a folder where you have, you have writing permission, because it looks like a file permission problem. So you need to be inside a folder where you can create subfolders, basically, if, uh, if I get it correctly. Okay, where is this app? 
this app is inside a file called app.js that defines a function called app. So the name of the function is the name of the component. The component can just normally be used by just calling its name with the JSX syntax. Uh, and the component is a function that returns some HTML code, some virtual DOM, basically. It looks like HTML code. It's, remember, it's not HTML code. Here we have create elements, uh, react.create elements nested that will create an object structure that represents the virtual DOM. But we don't see it. We know it's there. We don't see it. So if we want to change this application, we just have to change the content of this function. So imagine you don't want to you don't want to see all this uh, spinning logo. You want to see only your uh, maybe a hello world message. Okay, let's throw everything away and write a normal hello world. as the return value of this function. If I save the file and go back to the browser, you see that it, the content has been changed. So in the React um, development server, there's a live reloaded uh, reloading application, uh, reloading, reloading uh, say mechanism. Whenever you save a file, the browser is automatically updated. You don't need to stop the server, restart the server, reload the page, and so on. So everything is dynamic. Only works in development mode, of course, but it's very, very handy. Uh, in the function, you can write in JSX, of course. OK, here is the, we are creating a P element with no children and one uh, text inside. OK, but we're writing that just simply in the syntax. OK, uh, like I, I told you before, if you have the React, X, uh, where is that? OK, let's try to put it at the bottom so it's more visible. You can have, uh, things, if you install the React uh, plugin, uh, you have these uh, components that where you can see, we can inspect the code directly in HTML, or with the component side, you, you can see that your application is composed of one node which is called app with no properties right now, and so on. OK, so we, we may have a view of our, of our application in terms of the component that we create instead of the DOM nodes that are the final result. So it will be very easy, very helpful for us to, when, we, when we try to debug the application itself. OK, uh, how can we can ask ourselves, how can uh, the index know about uh, where to find this app because it's in, a it's in a different file. Okay, the app is in a different file. The function app is in a different file, and there is a mechanism of importing different uh, uh, resources into the some JavaScript code. Uh, importing uses a syntax uh, that uh, uh, is different from what we learned in Node.js. Uh, basically, in the in the browser, we are not using the uh, require keyword that we learn to use in Node.js. We use a different mechanism, which is based on an import and export uh, export statements that are the standard way. So require was defined by Node.js developers years and years, years and years ago, and then a standard way of importing modules were developed and standardized. And it's based on these a couple of import and export uh, keywords. Okay, we will see in this in more detail later. But for the moment, uh, this cheat sheet, cheat sheet uh, is everything we need to know. Okay, um, we know that inside the browser, require doesn't work. We need to use import for importing modules and export for creating a module that will export some resource, some function name, and something like that. Uh, recent versions of Node also allow using this import and export keywords, but not all the modules are being updated for that. So right now it's still in, a, in, a, in, the, in, the, in the middle of the transition, okay? But uh, uh, in the browser, we need to use this, uh, which are basically also easier to use. So if we 
uh, want to import a resource from a module, we can uh, use the import name from the path contains that contains the module, the file name that contains the module. There are different syntaxes because a module can export just one value by name or just by one value by default, by default value, basically. So uh, in this case, we have, you need to have uh, braces and in the other case, you just have to, to, to give your local name. Uh, there, are, there are different mechanisms or you can export a list of names one two three that can be imported you can import all of them or all or only some of them by name and so on okay but basically what we need to do we need to know is that we need to import some names with a slightly different syntax uh, according to how they were exported but it's just a detail from an external file. So in our case, there was this import app from app slash uh, dot slash app. It means that we are in index.js. Okay. Uh, what it means is that uh, we are importing the name app from the file app app.js that lives in our current directory. And this name app is used here. Is the function that is being called here, the, the component name. And the app file defines a function normally and exports this name. Export default means I normally I'm only exporting one name and this is it. Okay, so it can be imported easily. If you only if you are only exporting one name, you can use the default value and don't care about how to call the name. If you are exporting more names, of course, you need to more resources, of course, you need to, to specify the name. But there's, there are long fights over the internet about which kind of export is better. We don't want to join those fights. Uh, this import mechanism is also extended by React for importing images, for importing style sheets, and so on, that are pre-processed by, uh, by the React itself. Okay, so that the React compiler knows about the style sheets, puts all of them together, and a lot of a lot of other details. We have these two imports that are the most important ones that are for, uh, importing the real library. Okay, so where index is loading uh, the React, where we know that this index.js is actually running a React application is thanks to these uh, uh, two imports, where they also define from the React DOM symbol, the render method that starts everything. Okay. So, uh, but this is just the index.js is already done for us. We don't need to, to do anything special. Right? Just to, to learn about this, uh, this importing mechanism and how to structure in different files. So, basically, our work will be inside the application and not inside uh, the index. The index that we, we probably don't need to touch it anymore, okay? Uh, if we want to import or not import some, some style sheets, uh, instead of using the link statement uh, in, the, in the header, just use the import in the JavaScript uh, and it will be automatically converted. Okay, so uh, imagine you want to, okay, this hello world, uh, we want to make it into a button, for example. Okay, we can use a button instead of a P. And uh, we, oh, sorry, let's do the browser. And now it becomes a button. Uh, Giuseppe, the import echo mechanism no, is, a, is, is um, a standard JavaScript uh, in, uh, from EX, EX5. Uh, uh, it's been standardized in this way. And the browsers implement uh, directly this mechanism, which is a newer one. OK. so. Uh, I, I turned this paragraph into a button with nothing special uh, up, up to now. But just imagine that we, uh, we want to move this functionality, this button, into a different component instead of the app. So we don't write everything into one single component. I want to create my own button that will say, hello world. OK, so what can, what can I do? I could create a new file. I can call it, uh, I don't know, in, into the source directory, my button. 
Node.js. And we can define function, my button, that returns uh, the, the same code here. Um, OK. Just as a syntax detail, I can return everything in one line. If I go to more than one line, uh, it's better to include everything into a couple of parentheses. Since this is a, it's an expression, having the parentheses helps me mark the beginning and the end of the expression, even if it's split into different lines. Okay, so it's custom to return to use the parentheses for return. The parentheses are not needed by the by the return statement. They are uh, needed just to write the expression in many lines. Okay, otherwise there could be an, an implicit semicolon here that will stop um, the the return instruction at the first line. So if it goes into different lines, uh, usually you know it's better to place it into parentheses hmm? like this or with any kind of indentation that you like. I don't like this one. Okay. Okay. So I define my own component. I can use it in our application. So I don't want to, uh, the application is much more complex. So I want to uh, include my button, the my button component into the application. Of course, it doesn't work because my button is not defined here. I need to import it. I need to import it, import my button from slash my button. We don't need to have the JS extension. So we can import from our from another file the name of a component, which is just a function. But we also must remember that the component itself should export this name. So export default my button. So if I save everything, I'm saving up, I'm saving my button, I go to the browser. Okay, I get the same result, hello world. But you see that here, sorry, it's okay, I can, I can make it larger. App that calls my button. So right now we have two components nested inside each other. We could have more multiple instances of this button. One, two. Uh, Okay, uh, this is an expression that may only have one, one, uh, one tree. So I need to put them into a div. So I may have more than one. So an app contains uh, or instances or calls uh, many times the same component. And these are of course independent components that just happen to render equally. Okay. And what if I want to change the text that is written in the button? Maybe a button is written, I want to write a hello word in, Ita in English and the other in Italian. So I should have a parametric button, for example. A parametric button with I give a parameter like text equal to hello world. And the second one will receive a parameter, a property, a prop called um, Ciao Mondo. Then, sorry, what did they do? Then, 
But if I side, side this, this, nothing happens, of course, because the property has been passed to the component, but the component is not reading it. So what I need to do is to receive a parameter containing the properties. Props is an object that contains all the properties that have been passed to the, to the component. We will come to the details about all of this, right? This is just the first run where we where I want to give you a feeling of how everything fits together. Okay. So we'll go into details about JSX, about the properties and so on in the next classes. Now don't worry if you don't get every detail in or now. And so we can insert some properties inside here. Uh, but I cannot, I should write something like props dot uh, uh, text. The problem if 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 I write props.txt, it will insert props.txt into the button. Because this is not a string. This is a JavaScript expression where I want the value back. This can be done inside JSX by using a, a pair of braces. So basically, I'm returning a, a fragment of JSX that contains a, some JavaScript expression inside. So I save it. And now I have two buttons. The app calls my button one with a property called hello world and uh, my button with a property called text value ciao mondo. So uh, to answer to Francesco, yes, it's very normal to nest components and uh, usually React app have a very deep nesting of components like uh, as a design pattern because every component tries uh, to do one little part of the word of the work, sorry. And uh, uh, so you nest a component inside another and each one adds some little functionality to it. And uh, as the small components are easier to reuse, basically. Um, Manuel, is there a way to have a default value for the props.txt? No, normally props.txt is undefined, so you can try use the normal JavaScript like uh, uh, hi. So yeah, if if props.txt is undefined, then return hi. This is normal JavaScript code, like you would write. Uh, uh, there's no special syntax for that. So if I have a third button, we do I don't have the property. You, I will get high. Okay. Okay. Um, Antonio is worried about the style of this of this application. He doesn't like the style here, and you want to remove uh, the, the the style of this application. Uh, actually, um, CSS does not use. Uh, Current, uh, React is not using Bootstrap, okay, right now. But it's importing. Uh, so we are importing some CSS here in in app, and we are importing some CSS also in index. You don't like it? You just comment it here and there. And what you get is the uh, okay, the important here, okay. App index. Okay, so let me. Yes, you should get the the default. Yeah, this this should be the default for the browser. You see the margin have, have changed a bit. Hmm? But actually, what I would like to do is really to use Bootstrap because I don't want to write CSS by hand every time. Okay, so is there a way to integrate uh, Bootstrap into a React application? Yes, there is. And uh, uh, yeah, well, okay, like uh, I could add in normally the the Bootstrap code into the head of the index.html 
and uh, write uh, my code uh, normally but there's a nice library called so we could do that normally like we did last week from index.html and then you can render the bootstrap with the with the proper um, classes for the components but uh, there's a, an easier way of using some com a component which is called react bootstrap that re-implements all the uh, bootstrap uh, uh, classes as react components so instead of inserting a div class equal container, you just insert a container component that you import from the React Bootstrap library. And it's much, from a syntax point of view, it's much cleaner. You can see it here in the, the, this website. And it's very easy to add to our project because we just have to go to the development, stop the project, control C, and install, npm install, React Bootstrap. That creates, uh, installs the library of the components that re-implement uh, the Bootstrap uh, elements, the Bootstrap classes. Takes some time, always. And so npm install React Bootstrap instead of the library, and also I will also install Bootstrap, which is another module that just contains this, the basic CSS for Bootstrap, also the basic styles. So these two packages, React Bootstrap and Bootstrap. I install them into my project so that I can import them when I need them. So for example, so right now I imported them, I start the project again, and nothing changed for the moment because of course uh, I'm not using this library. It's the same project. But if I want, sorry, if I want, I could add to my application, instead of having a div, we can have a container. Hmm? A container. Uh, right now it doesn't know what a container is. We can import it, import container from uh, react bootstrap slash container so instead of a div we have a container we can have a, a container with a row and in this row we may have one column okay row should be uh, so we can import row and column also. Uh, it's a bit of pain at the beginning of doing all these imports. Uh, after a while, uh, um, the, the, the ID, the visual code, uh, uh, we learn uh, and uh, with the auto completion, uh, you can find, uh, you, you can uh, automatically insert the import statements. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, okay, but right now, so we, we right now have uh, imported the Bootstrap library. The, the style didn't change very much because we are not importing the uh, CSS yet. So there's still one instruction to insert, to import, you need to import this one into your app.js file. Because right now we are using the classes, but we don't have the CSS styles for Bootstrap itself. So we take them from the Bootstrap library. So it's another step that we, can, we may import here instead of the initial CSS that was available. And the style of the button changed or the style of the page and the margin and so on. So right now we are really into a container style with, the, uh, with, the, um, with Bootstrap. Okay, uh, one last step I want to add before breaking for a while is to add some behavior to these buttons. 
So right now, what do we have? Uh, we have some button that is only able to render one string of text. Um, maybe we can generalize it a bit more and having this button be able to render a text that depends on the language. Okay, so I want to say, okay, this button, I don't, I, I'm not passing you the text, I'm, I'm telling you the language. So it's more flexible. Language is English. Or language is uh, Italian, for example. Of course, if I do this, it all goes undefined because I need to change my button not to use a props.txt, but to use the the, the language. So, for example, I can uh, maybe define a messages object like um, if the mapping English to Hello World and uh, Italian to Ciao Mondo. I can do whatever I want with this function, okay? So I can return not props, uh, which I would say props. Uh, I can say let text equal to uh, props dot language messages from messages, for example. Otherwise, if uh, uh, so let's uh, props dot language is undefined, then I can text equal to high, for example as okay uh, what's the error here It is not the shortest one, but uh, they can write but it's a scoping problem. Okay, so uh, okay, it could be written in a in an easier way, but just for showing that you can do whatever you want with this function, do your computation, do your conversion, as long as you return a JSX element. And so in this case, we have these buttons that render different texts because they know the first one is. Uh, uh, is uh, um, my button with the language English. The second is a button with language Italian and so on. The third one that didn't have any language. And so it, it took the default value. Hmm? So we can do any computation. That's why we may have a component that we want to reuse many times. And this component will decide what to render, how to render it according to the properties. We can make the last step by adding also some state. Okay. Uh, the imports of row and column is just here. Uh, the last step we could, we could add is uh, um, adding some state, okay? Adding the state means, uh, uh, for example, if I click on a button, I want to change uh, the language. So if I click on hello world, it will become ciao mondo and vice versa. If I click on ciao mondo, it will become hello world. So that we can see how to add some dynamic behavior. Right now, everything is set up at the beginning. In app, I... I'm deciding 
everything about the application. Then my button doesn't have anything to do except analyzing the, pro the properties, the parameters, and then rendering, returning the rendered page. Okay. Uh, but nothing can change dynamically. For changing something, we need to add some event handlers in the buttons and some state where the state changes may have an effect and over over the rendering of the page. Okay. Uh, so maybe before adding this last step, which is just three, three or four instructions, but conceptually it's a, it's a big step, I would um, probably have a break right now, okay, if you agree. So that I can commit this code right now, you can, uh, you can also show it, uh, see it on, on, on GitHub. And so we have, a, we have a commit point here where everything is only using imports, components, bootstrap and properties these are the four ingredients that we use in this simple example then after the break we'll try to add uh, a state uh, but at least we have the two versions before and after with the first and the second commit okay and also will uh, help us also to <laughs> to digest a bit uh, bit by bit uh, uh, what we have been uh, um, seeing together okay so I, I propose we can stop uh, for 15 minutes. If there are no questions at the moment, uh, probably we are all very overwhelmed by uh, the many new concepts. OK, so we can meet back at 10. Uh, 10 no, 30 is too late, uh, can be 20, 28. Let's say to be, let's try to be f exactly 15 minutes. Okay, see you later then.